Thank you very much, George, for your very kind um, and concise introduction. Thank you to Charles for a fascinating presentation um, on a complementary theme. And um, I'm grateful to Judith for discouraging me for introducing myself as a bearable anomaly. <laughs> In the autumn of 2003, the Archbishops of Canterbury and York and the, President, the Vice President of the Methodist Conference signed the Anglican Methodist Covenant for England in the presence of Her Majesty the Queen and a galaxy of ecclesiastical dignitaries and guests. Signing ceremonies in the Methodist Central Hall Westminster and Westminster Abbey emphasised the mutuality of the commitment undertaken by the two denominations. Unlike previous unity schemes, the covenant was deliberately cautious and modest in scope drawing on a comparatively new ecumenical methodology. In a common statement, it defined the conditions for full visible unity. It set out the extent to which the Methodist Church of Great Britain and the Church of England had and had not met those conditions. And it pledged the churches to work together on their remaining differences. The covenant then was framed as a work in progress or a waymark on a journey rather than a final destination. Since 2003, as we've heard, a succession of ecumenical commissions has been wrestling with those outstanding differences, particularly around the mutual recognition of ministries. Proposals to resolve the conundrum of reconciliation without, on the one hand, surrendering the Anglican commitment to episcopacy, or on the other hand, requiring Methodists to submit to brackets reordination, came before General Synod in February and to come into Methodist Conference in July. I'll say a little bit more about those proposals later, although I think Charles has covered that pretty thoroughly. Um, but I want to make the point now that the covenant, although the outcome of six years of formal conversations between the two churches, was only one brief episode in a much longer story of Anglican Methodist relations, stretching back to the days of the Wesley brothers. So in this presentation today, I want to take the very long view of Anglican Methodist unity and to reflect on the story so far. Part of the reason for doing this is to offer a trailer for a conference Bill Gibson is organising at Oxford Brooks in the autumn and to flag up the wonderful resource of the Kingsley Barrett Papers, recently acquired by the Oxford Centre of Methodism and Church History and superbly calendared there by Jane Platt. So this is a good moment to revisit the conversations of the 50s and 60s in which Kingsley Barrett was a doughty protagonist. Now, the timing is particularly opportune with the latest round of proposals on the neuralgic issues of oversight and ministry now before the conference and the synod. So, where to begin? Well, the obvious place to start, of course, is with the Wesley brothers and with a question. How did it come about that two lifelong adherents of the Church of England, faithful, committed, even bigoted in their churchmanship, ended up taking the credit or the blame for the genesis of a new denomination? John Wesley famously wrote, I am a Church of England man, and in the church I will live and die unless I am thrust out. And yet, less than a decade later, and within scarcely four years of Wesley's death, the conference has given permission for Methodist priests to administer the sacrament of Holy Communion to the societies, and by the mid-19th century, the Methodist movement in Great Britain comprised a squabbling family of denominations clearly separate from the church. How did this happen? Was it accident? or design, providence or pragmatism, a movement of the Holy Spirit or a massive mistake. Well, the story of the separation of Methodism from the church has been told and retold over the years from a variety of perspectives. For an older generation of denominational historians like Luke Tyman and J.H. Rigg, Methodist new wine simply could not be contained within the stale old wineskins of the established church. Methodism had an evangelical dynamic which made separation inevitable. Writing in the 1940s, A.W. Harrison took a similar view, although without Tymon and Riggs polemical edge. And Frank Baker in John Wesley the Church of England, 1970, argued on broadly similar lines. Much more recently, Gareth Lloyd has challenged the picture of a reluctant Wesley trying to hold the preachers back from separation and has suggested that in the early days of the revival, both Wesley brothers sat loose to church discipline. By the mid-1750s, Charles Wesley was reaffirming his commitment to the church, while John was wavering 
and the preachers were divided. So can we pick a way through this range of interpretations? We need to note first that the Wesleys were born and nurtured within the Church of England. True enough, there were nonconformists on both paternal and maternal sides of the family tree, but Samuel and Susanna Wesley did not broadcast this lineage to their family. At Hepworth and at Oxford, the brothers were trained in the beliefs, practices and assumptions of the high church school, with a leaning towards the non-jurors. Although encounters with Moravians and Pietists in Georgia and London in the 1730s, followed by the evangelical experience of 1738, qualified and softened their rigid high churchmanship, the Wesleys continued to cherish the rites and doctrines of the church. Even while revising the Book of Common Prayer for Methodists in North America in 1784, John Wesley affirmed that, I believe there is no liturgy in the world, either in ancient or modern language, which breathes more of a solid, scriptural, rational piety than the common prayer of the Church of England. An instinctive loyalty to the church was complemented by an attitude to dissent, which Jeremy Gregory has characterised as, at times, surprisingly bitter and prejudiced. Secondly, when the question of separation from the church was raised, the Wesleys generally took a stand against it. In 1755, for example, separation was canvassed among the preachers. Charles Wesley penned an epistle to the Reverend Mr. John Wesley, underlining that the purpose of Methodism was to renew the church, not to break away from it. Was it our aim, disciples to collect, to raise a party, or to found a sect? No, but to spread the power of Jesus' name, rebuild, repair the walls of our Jerusalem, <coughs> revive the piety of ancient days, and fill the earth with our Redeemer's praise. More than 30 years later, West John Wesley was still holding out against Methodist services taking place in church hours and denying the claims of the preachers to the ministerial office. How far Wesley's words and actions were guided by principle and how far by pragmatism is a moot point. It's certainly the case that maintaining a position within the established church gave the Methodist movement access and opportunities which were denied to those who threw in their lot with dissent. And surely Wesley was alive to these realities. And, despite clerical opposition and episcopal misgivings, the 18th century Church of England remained remarkably tolerant of and hospitable towards the Methodist cuckoo in its nest. Having said that, there were sources of tension and strain. In the course of some 50 years, the Wesley brothers gradually created a church within the church, building up a network of societies, a cadre of itinerant preachers, and a movement independent of Episcopal control. Members, societies, and preachers were defined by their connection with John Wesley. And through the institution of the conference, the framing of the model deed, and the engrossing of the deed of declaration, Wesley ensured that his connection became an entity which could outlive him. In significant ways, moreover, Wesley clearly breached the order of the established church in calling preachers, in licensing chapels, in disregarding parish boundaries, and above all, in his ordinations, first for North America, 1784, then for Scotland and for England. Ever the Oxford logician, Wesley justified his actions, whether by necessity, by research, or by careful definition of terms like separation and schism. But by 1791, Wesley had stretched the limits of Anglican comprehensiveness to breaking point and beyond. The rationale for the development of Methodism was the priority of the mission of God. In his letter to the pseudonymous John Smith in 1746, Wesley wrote this. What is the end of all ecclesiastical order? Is it not to bring souls from the power of Satan to God and to build them up in his fear and love? Order then is so far valuable as it answers these ends. If it answers them not, it is nothing worth. This evangelical imperative ultimately trumped church order, and it gave Wesley a standard by which to judge the contemporary church and to justify the Methodist movement. Methodism was a providential work of God served by its extraordinary messengers. The church, although blessed by its heritage, its liturgy and its sacraments, was too often let down by its clergy. Heathenish priests and mitred infidels, to quote Brother Charles. Wesley's Methodism, therefore, was an unstable compound, oscillating uneasily between loyalty to the church 
and criticism of the establishment between dependence and self-sufficiency. And this left a challenging legacy to Wesley's heirs and successors. When John Wesley died in March 1791, the pressing ecumenical question was not about Anglican Methodist unity, but about Methodist separation from the Church of England. Long-standing issues like the desire of some Methodist preachers to hold worship services at the same time as services in the parish church, and pressure for preachers to be authorised to celebrate Holy Communion in the societies, continued to vex the connection. The latter issue, which almost split the movement in 1795, was resolved by the Plan of Pacification, which allowed celebration where a majority of the trustees and leaders agreed and the conference approved. Moreover, Wesley's death brought to the fore questions of succession and polity. Who would succeed to Wesley's role as linchpin of the connection? Would ordinations continue? If so, in what way and under what conditions? How would Methodist ministry be structured? And how, if at all, would it relate to the existing authorities of the Church of England? Although some work has been done on the 1790s, particularly by John Bomer and David Hempton, there is scope for much more detailed investigation of the policies, politics and personalities of that tumultuous decade. Under the 1784 Deed of Declaration, the Conference, or rather the Legal Hundred, inherited Wesley's powers over his connection. Some of the leading preachers made a pitch for a threefold ministry in the so-called Litchfield Plan of 1794, arguing that the itinerant should be ordained first deacon and then, and then elder, and that the connection should be divided into seven or eight territorial areas, each under a district superintendent. John Paulson, one of the Litchfield group, has asserted that this plan corresponded with Wesley's own intentions and claimed that Wesley had in fact ordained Cook and Mather as bishops. The conference, however, rejected the scheme, apparently without discussion. The mood of the 1790s was against hierarchy, against episcopacy, and in favour of equality among the preachers with no more kings in our Israel, and a healthy suspicion of the overweening ambition of high-profile figures like Dr Cook. Thus the conference created a network of districts, but without separated chairmen. The presiding officer at the district meeting would be an itinerant and a circuit appointment designated by the conference. Ordination ceased until the 1830s, so that there would be no division among the preachers. Reception into full connection with the conference became virtual ordination. Oversight, episcopate, was vested in the collective pastorate and articulated through the conference. Methodism in the 1790s then took some further steps away from the church and towards ecclesial self-sufficiency. The thinking behind these developments and the implications for relations with the church were debated in pamphlets of the period, like Samuel Bradburn's 1792 manifesto, the question, are the Methodist dissenters fairly examined? Bradburn took a middle line between those like Thomas Taylor, who asserted roundly that the Methodists were dissenters, and those like Joseph Benson and the advocates of the old plan who placed Methodism firmly within the church. Bradburn seeking to, and I quote, remove prejudice, prevent bigotry, and promote brotherly love. Quite a big ask in the 1790s. <laughs> Argued that Methodism was in fact a coalition of loyal churchmen, occasional conformists, and quasi-dissenters. It was open to pious people of any persuasion, and he warned against any moves which might divide the connection, either by pressing for separation, or by insisting that Methodists must attend their parish churches. Building and sustaining consensus, keeping the whole thing together, won the day, and the Wesleyans took care to maintain their distinctive identity while eschewing overt separation. It's worth noting a couple of things about the backdrop to these developments. First, the debate about whether Methodists were or weren't dissenters was taking place at a time of considerable political unrest, when leading dissenters were giving vocal support to the French Revolution, and when conservative forces in church and state were taking the opportunity to brand nonconformity as politically disloyal, socially subversive, and religiously heterodox. So many Methodists, for reasons of pragmatism and self-preservation, as well as principle, were keen to distance themselves from the negative associations of dissent. Well, second, Methodism in this period began to experience significant numerical growth and to face tensions between consolidation and revivalism. 
it's very tempting, but it's also far too simple to line up revivalists, Democrats and dissenters on the one hand against conservative, consolidating churchmen on the other, although there were some people who fit both of those stereotypes. The important point to make is that debates over the style, the identity, the mission and the structures of Methodism overlapped, and so did wrangles about ecclesial identity and evangelistic strategy, to say nothing of institutional survival. Through the 1790s and early 1800s, some Methodists pressed for a clearer alignment of Methodism with dissent, and they were disappointed with the cautious attitude of the conference. Alexander Killam, for example, was very open about his identification as a dissenter, although his departure from the Wesleyan connection had more to do with questions of policy and control than relations between church and uh, society. At the other end of the spectrum, Methodists who felt a close affinity with the Church of England responded to the developments of the 1790s in a couple of ways. Some withdrew from Methodism altogether. Henry Durbin of Bristol, for example, had joined the Methodist movement in the early 1740s, overcoming an initial disapproval of John Wesley's practice of extemporary prayer. Fifty years later, however, as Bristol became a focal point for conflict over whether Holy Communion could be administered to the societies, Durbin was distressed by the disputes which took place concerning the sacrament, and then he withdrew with many other respectable persons who had long been highly valued by us. So wrote John Paulson. And Gareth Lloyd gives more examples of this, where people found their loyalty to the church, requiring them to sever their links with Methodism. But many church Methodists were able to sustain a dual commitment, particularly when service times were complementary and not in competition. Well into the 19th century, Wesleyans continued to attend their parish churches, to support evangelical ministers, even to hold office as church wardens. But as the century wore on, this position became more difficult to sustain, and Anglican-Methodist relationships became more fractious. For British Methodism, the middle years of the 19th century, say from the 1820s to the 1880s, were years of growth, controversy and consolidation. Rapid numerical growth in the early part of the century went hand in hand with secessions and expulsions from the old connection and the rise of new Methodist denominations. So by the time of the 1851 religious census, there were some two and a half million attendances in 10,000 Methodist places of worship, but these were spread across seven different denominations. Wesleyan membership, especially hard hit by the controversy over reform in the late 1840s, topped 300,000 by 1871, the next largest group, Primitive Methodists, uh, claim nearly 150,000 members. And denominational consolidation was expressed in the creation of institutions, whether central departments and connectional committees to manage property and administer overseas missions, colleges to train ministers and teachers, day schools, publishing houses, newspapers and periodicals. And this consolidation reflected a stronger sense of denominational identity as an era of pan-evangelical cooperation gave way to one of separate organisations. At national level, the Wesleyan Methodist Missionary Society was created partly to stop Methodist money being siphoned off to support the Congregationalist London Missionary Society. Locally, there was a drive to set up Wesleyan Sunday schools and day schools in place of long-established non-denominational institutions. It was as blatant as that. And these Methodist developments took, were taking place against the backdrop of rapid industrialisation and urbanisation. 1851 marked the tipping point after which more people lived in towns than in the countryside, and the proportion of people living in large conurbations steadily increased. So all Christian churches faced the opportunity and the challenge of urban mission, also working in a society with an expanding political nation and therefore a more popular political agenda. Three changes within the Church of England were of particular significance for Anglican Methodist relations in this period. First, internal and external pressures brought about a series of reforms to the institutions and governance of the Church and to the training and work of the clergy. Some of these were imposed by Act of Parliament on a reluctant Church. Some evolved through Church state cooperation. Some were initiated by reforming bishops keen, keen to remodel Protestant structures. And some reforms were strenuously advocated by nonconformists, but successfully resisted by the church. 
Throughout these years, the Wesley Methodist establishment carefully avoided entanglement in campaigns for church reform, and especially in those which seemed to come from religious or political interests hostile to the Church of England. The official line was that the Wesleyans were not dissenters, that they bore no animus against the church, and that involvement with political campaigning or agitation would be both a distraction from the connection's primary task of saving souls and a potential threat to spiritual well-being. In 1831, Life of Wesley, Richard Watson, one of the leading lights of the connection in those days, wrote of the Church of England, We wish her prosperity and perpetuity as we wish all other Christian churches, and the more so, as you recognise in her the mother of us all. And that was a phrase taken from Wesley's reasons against the separation from the Church of England. Not all Wesleyans agreed with Watson, some very much didn't, and the general attitude of the other Methodist denominations was much less positive towards the Church. But the Wesleyan Conference stood firm against calls for disestablishment and disendowment, and even opposed the abolition of compulsory Church rates. The second significant change concerned education. By the 1830s, a consensus was developing that the existing national provision for elementary education was insufficient. The voluntary bodies providing it, the Anglican National Society and the large dissenting British and Foreign School Society, couldn't cope with increasing numbers. And behind all of this, there were arguments about whether there should be state aid to schools and on what conditions and what would happen to both church and nonconformity if the state put money into education. And the story is complex, so I'll skip over the detail. But um, the outcomes were to give state support to church schools and to other faith schools, but also from 1870 to have rate support to non denominational board schools. And uh, that offered opportunities for Christians of all kinds to be involved in the educational world in new ways. The third change I've touched on already was the rise of the Oxford movement, beginning with John Keeble's Assize Sermon of 1833 and the Tracts for the Times, and then developing into a parish-based high church revival and evolving into Anglo-Catholicism. In their eagerness to reassert the apostolical authority of the church, to recover the liturgical and sacramental treasures of English Catholicism, and to reclaim the nation for the national church, the Tractarians and their successors were at best dismissive of Methodism, the refuge of those whom the church stints of the gifts of grace, uh, first preface to the tracts, and at worst, deeply antagonistic to it. Methodists of all kinds reciprocated, defending their ministry and their apostolic credentials, and accusing the Tractarians of attempting to Romanise a Protestant church. In 1866, J.H. Rigg, one of the most prolific and pugnacious of Wesleyan controversialists, asserted that there is not the remotest possibility of the Wesleyan Methodist Church ever being absorbed in the Church of England. Rigg wrote in the knowledge that the prospect of reunion had been canvassed by several bishops, including Henry Philpotts, it was raised again in 1873, by Christopher Wordsworth, Bishop of Lincoln. Home reunion, however, was not seriously on the agenda in the mid-19th century. Bishops were more likely to criticise the Methodists or to receive individual Methodists into the Church, while Methodism continued to grow by evangelising nominal Anglicans. Francis Knight has described the gradual change through the century as patterns of coexistence and shared attendance between church and chapel gave way to exclusive loyalties. In a new world of activist incumbents, turning parish churches, in her phrase, from a resource for the community into a resort for the devout, Methodists moved or were pushed into closer contact with nonconformity. And it was as part of a broader free church movement that Anglican Methodist unity came to the fore in the closing decades of the Victorian era. The half century from the 1890s to the 1930s witnessed apparently contradictory developments in Anglican Methodist relationships. On the one hand, Methodism became more explicitly part of a reconfigured free church movement, with the Wesleyans in particular becoming much less inhibited about endorsing criticisms of the established church. On the other hand, however, in this period, structured negotiations for visible unity began. So let's trace the tendencies and developments of the years from Henry Lunn's review of the churches to the aftermath of the 1920 Lambeth Conference's appeal to all Christian people. 
First point to make is that Methodism in these years was drawn more closely into the orbit of the free churches, with less reference being made to Wesleyanism as a third way between historic descent and the church. A relaxation of creedal Calvinism by Congregationalists and Baptists, a recasting of Wesleyan teaching on Christian perfection by Methodists, a growing church consciousness across the free churches, softening the Congregationalist connectional divide, a shared antipathy to Anglo Catholicism, and an increasing identification with Gladstonian liberalism enable Methodists of all kinds to work much more closely with the other free churches on evangelistic, philanthropic, and political endeavours. When the veteran Wesleyan Thomas Jackson reflected in the 18, on the 1830s in his memoirs, written 40 years later, he recalled that the dissenters were provoked by Wesleyan Methodism's anti-Calvinistical theology and its connectional economy. Jaggenis Rogers, Congregationalist, describing his boyhood as a child of the manse in Prescott in the same years, remembered that there was comparatively little intercourse and still less of vital sympathy between the Wesleyans and other dissenters, continuing, the truth is, they did not like our Calvinism upon the one hand or our strong liberalism upon the other. Rogers, writing in the early 20th century, 40 years after Jackson, went on to comment how things had changed during, during his long, long lifetime. Since those days, we have abated in the first, that's the Calvinism, and they have relaxed their dread of the other, that's the liberalism. The visible expression of this rapprochement was the Free Church Council movement, which developed in the 1890s. Support for a Free Church Congress was canvassed by West Midlands nonconformists as early as 1867, perhaps in response to the Anglican Church Congress of that year. But it wasn't until 1890 that the idea took root. The proposal for a Congress of the Free Churches was advanced by Guinness Rogers in the pages of Hugh Price Hughes' Methodist Times, and Hughes was one of the leading advocates of the movement. The first Congress met here in Manchester in November 1892, with 370 members, all attending in a personal capacity, not as denominational representatives. 53 of them were Wesleyans. The Congregationalists provided almost three times as many. As local nonconformist or free church councils were established, the Congress was shaped to represent the localities. In 1896, the Congress became the National Council of the Evangelical Free Churches. Within a year, there were over 200 local councils and federations. By 1901, 700 local councils and 36 district federations. The Free Church Council movement brought together the positive and the negative agendas of nonconformity, especially evangelical nonconformity. National and local meetings continued to inveigh against the perceived pretensions of the established church, retelling horror stories of clerical intolerance and protesting about the injustices of denominational schools. In December 1897, for instance, John Massey, tutor at the Congregationalist Mansfield College, Oxford, and president of the Oxford and District Free Church Council, challenged the Vicar of St Barnabas' Oxford over remarks allegedly made by teachers and nonconformist pupils at the local church school to the effect that you can't go to heaven and our Lord did not found the chapel but he did found the church. The Oxford Council, strongly supported by Wesleyans as well as Baptists, Congregationalists and Free and Primitive Methodists, sent lecturers out into the rural hinterland to expound the principles of the Reformation and they worried about villages which lacked a free church place of worship. When the 1902 Education Act became law, the free church councils became rallying points for opposition and for the campaign of passive resistance to the education rate. Plenty of evidence then of tensions between an assertive free church movement and the Church of England. At the same time, however, all of the churches were being affected by the same intellectual, cultural and aesthetic tendencies all were facing the same challenges in mission. All denominations had to address the questions posed by modern thought, by Darwinism, and the pervasive influence of evolution, by disputed critical readings of the Bible, by disquiet at traditional interpretations of the atonement and eternal punishment. Stella Wood has identified a broad church theological influence derived from Coleridge, Arnold and Morris across the English churches in these, in these years. At the same time, the assumptions and ascetics of the Gothic revival crossed denominational boundaries and both expressed and strengthened a concern for ecclesiology. 
The church building boom of the later 19th century saw Methodists construct Gothic churches with towers, spires, chancels and stained glass windows. Or Methodist theologians like Benjamin Gregory and John Scott Lidgett reflected on the doctrines of the church. Hugh Price Hughes expressed his admiration for the 1889 general hymn hymnary because it had more hymns on the church Catholic than contemporary Wesleyan hymnals. Tracing the long history of the ecumenical movement, Ruth Rouse drew attention to the changing ecumenical climate of the 19th century and to a range of voluntary organisations which brought Christians of different denominations together. It might be suggested that several structural developments are also important in facilitating ecumenical contact. The revival of the convocations, for example, gave the Church of England a mechanism for discussion and decision-making. The creation of the Lambeth Conference provided a forum for wider consultation across the Anglican Communion, and the endorsement of the so-called Chicago Lambeth Quadrilateral by the Congress of 1888 offered the definition of principles of unity, which provided a framework for formal negotiations, as Charles has said, on the basis of the acceptance of the Scriptures, the Apostles and Nicene Creeds, the Sacraments of Baptism and the Lord's Supper, and the Historic Episcopate. Three years after the Lambeth Conference, Henry Lunn, a Wesleyan minister and close ally of Hugh Price Hughes, founded the, the Review of the Churches to promote interdenominational unity and greater understanding. In January 1892, Lund took a group of Anglican and Free Church leaders to the Swiss resort of Grindelwald for the first in a series of reunion conferences. Although the conferences did not produce a formal agreement, Grindelwald clarified the differences between the churches, fostered contact among church leaders, and placed home reunion firmly on the denomination's agendas. Two other developments helped to keep reunion before the minds of the churches. One was the burgeoning student Christian movement, initially a pan-evangelical enterprise, but one which broadened in the first decade of the 20th century to include liberal and Catholic Anglicans. The other was the international missionary movement. In 1910, a World Missionary Conference convened in Edinburgh, the first such international gathering to embrace both high church and free church representatives as official delegates of their respective societies. Unity for the sake of mission was a key theme of the conference, and among the initiatives stemming from Edinburgh was the Faith and Order movement, which led ultimately to the World Council of Churches in 1948. Moving to the Lambeth Conference of 1920, at the conference, Archbishop Davidson suggested the idea of an appeal to all Christian people, and this captured the imagination of the assembled bishops. The appeal modified the Chicago Lambeth Quadrilateral by replacing the explicit reference to the historic episcopate with a commitment to a ministry acknowledged by every part of the church as possessing not only the inward call of the spirit, but also the commission of Christ and the authority of the whole body. But it went on to affirm that the episcopate would be the one means of providing such a ministry. Appeal led to five years of negotiations between Anglican and Free Church representatives, in which Methodists Scott Lidgett and A.S. Peake took a prominent part. Although the Free Churches were prepared to accept that ordination in a future United Church should be Episcopal, the question of reconciling existing ministries would prove a fatal stumbling block because the Anglicans insisted on unconditional ordination and the Free Churches would not accept it. Lambeth 1930 seemed to step back from home reunion excluding the free churches from the conference's opening communion service at St Paul's before turning to debate the scheme for the United Church in South India. Ecumenism had truly moved into the era of heavyweight reports and official resolutions and to the politics of church assemblies. Of course, in parallel with discussions with the Church of England and the free churches, Methodists were engaged in their own quest for home reunion, at least from the third quarter of the 19th century. Unsurprisingly, some of the arguments for Methodist union were very similar to those advanced for union between Methodists and Anglicans, especially greater efficiency in the use of resources for mission and the avoidance of wasteful competition. Some of the stumbling blocks in the way of progress were also similar, disagreements about ministerial prerogatives and the rights of the laity, differences of polity and governance, and bitter memories of past conflicts. Despite these difficulties, the Methodist New Connection, the Bible Christians and the United Methodist Free Churches achieved union in 1907 and the newly formed United Methodist Church joined with the Wesleyans and the Primitive Methodists in 1932 to form the Methodist Church of Great Britain. For some Methodists, 
the reunion of the branches of the Methodist movement was a step on the way to a wider ecumenism. For others, however, it represented the creation of a strong alternative to the Church of England. The deed of union, adopted by the uniting denominations in 1932, was careful to affirm the place of Methodism in the Church Catholic, and to express the view of ordained ministry clearly at odds with the Anglo-Catholic understanding which held sway in the Church of England. Christ's ministers hold no priest to differing in kind from that which is common to all the Lord's people, and they have no exclusive title to the preaching of the gospel or the care of souls. Although the 1932 union was a consummation of more than a decade of negotiation and debate, making union effective locally took at least another generation to accomplish. Thus, when Archie Harrison delivered his Fernley Hartley Lecture of 1942 on the Evangelical Revival and Christian Reunion, followed by a lecture to the Wesley Historical Society in 1945 on the separation of Methodism from the Church of England, he took it for granted that Methodist energies for the foreseeable future would be devoted to reconciling Wesleyans, Primitive Methodists and Free Methodists within the United Church. Our best policy for the next generation is to cultivate our own garden, he said, a task which is big enough to occupy all our attention. Harrison thought that, although the spirit of cooperation and friendliness between the Church of England and the Free Churches has grown considerably, the desire for union seems to have receded. Just over a year later, November 1946, Archbishop Geoffrey Fisher, preaching a university sermon in Cambridge, challenged the English churches to move towards a free and unfettered exchange of life in worship and sacrament, and in particular invited the free churches to take episcopacy into their systems and to try it out on their own ground. This innovative proposal led to conversations between Anglican and free church reps and to a flurry of resolutions and reports. Methodist Conference proved the most amenable to further exploration, and from 1956 to 63, a joint committee met, leading to proposals for a two-stage process of reunion. At stage one, the two denominations would remain separate, but establish intercommunion and the mutual recognition of ministries. This would be achieved through a service of reconciliation for those already ordained, through the appointment of bishops by the Methodist Conference, and by guarantee that future Methodist ordinations would be invariably Episcopal. At stage two, at some point in the more distant future, full visible unity in one church would be implemented. It may be seen that the conversations sought to square the circle of Anglican commitment to the historic Episcopate and Methodist opposition to reordination by proposing mutual recognition in the service of reconciliation. Whether this was to be construed or could be construed as reordination or conditional ordination exercised Methodist dissensions from the scheme, but also worried both Anglo-Catholics, anxious to safeguard Catholic order, and Evangelicals who thought that the proposals rested on a sectarian view of episcopacy. In the end, after years of debate within the denominations and a large quantity of ill-tempered polemic, although the Methodist Conference endorsed the scheme in July 1969, the Church of England failed to achieve a necessary majority in the convocations. A second attempt at the revised scheme at the same fate in General Synod in 1972. Michael Ramsey, Archbishop of Canterbury, expressed his deep disappointment, telling a gathering of bishops at the Mansion House, it is the Methodists who are the leaders now. Adrian Hastings offers a more caustic assessment, and I quote, Methodism in the 1960s, while awaiting union, had little history, except for an unprecedented rate of numerical decline. At the end, it was left with only a smack in the face. Of a tart. Through the 1970s and 80s, a wider ecumenism held the stage with the Church's Unity Commission, the Ten Propositions, January 1976, and the formation of the Church's Council of Covenanting, which produced a scheme towards visible unity proposals for a covenant in 1980. Although more modest in scope than the conversation, seeking simply to achieve mutual recognition of ministries among the Methodist, Moravian and United Reformed Churches and the Church of England, towards visible unity also failed to win sufficient support in General Synod. Unity in this period was manifested in local ecumenical projects, like the partnerships, where ecumenical experiment was possible. More than a decade after the failing of covenanting for unity, the Methodist Church made a new approach to the Church of England, 
and this led to a series of informal conversations and to the report Commitment to Mission and Unity, 1996. This set an agenda for formal conversations, underscored the missionary imperative, and offered suggestions for ways in which local relationships might be strengthened. These guidelines characterised the talks which led to the 2003 Covenant, a fairly cautious step-by-step approach to unity, building on established areas of agreement, an emphasis on a priority of mission, and a focus on grassroots reconciliation rather than a remote top-down scheme imposed by church leaders. The same approach flowed from the Covenant through the work of the Joint Implementation Commission and has led to the proposals now before the Synod and the Conference. So to some concluding reflections. It's easy for the story of church unity to become a mind-numbing sequence of denominational resolutions and reports. And maybe you're feeling by now that I've demonstrated that conclusion very amply. So a couple of broad, of broad conclusions to offer. First is that the shape of Christian unity has varied a lot over time. 18th century Methodists were exercised about whether they should or should not stay within the Church of England and in defending themselves against accusations of schism. 19th century Methodists, in common with most evangelical Protestants, understood unity as a spiritual phenomenon as much as or more than a structural or organisational one and emphasised working together in agencies like the Bible Society and the Evangelical Alliance rather than merging denominations. Visible unity became a much stronger concept later in the 19th century and into the 20th century perhaps with a greater church consciousness and a growing critique of the classic evangelical conception of the true church as an invisible fellowship of believers. The second is that the rationale for Christian unity and the priority of Christian unity have varied too. For some, visible unity has mattered principally because it's right in principle, reflecting Jesus' high priestly prayer in John 17 that they may all be one. But is that actually a prayer for denominational amalgamation or for fellowship in the gospel? For others, unity has mattered for reasons of apologetics. How can Christians credibly proclaim a gospel of reconciliation while they are visibly separated from one another? And for others, unity has been mainly about a pragmatic pooling of resources, ecclesiastical economies of scale. Third reflection is that the strength absolute, relative and perceived of the prospective partners has a major bearing on whatever proposals are being advanced. When denominations feel that they are succeeding, do they also feel confident in approaching others or do they see ecumenism as unnecessary? Conversely, when denominations feel that they are struggling, do they look elsewhere for support or lack the energy for anything beyond survival? Archie Harrison was upbeat about Methodism's prospects in 1945 and he saw home reunion as a pretty remote proposition. Since the 1960s, the situation has been very different. The fourth is that although the proponents of unity schemes may be very absorbed in their particular projects, the fate of any scheme owes a lot to other relationships and wider contexts. Thinking just about ecumenical horizons, Anglicans hoping for reunion with Rome tended to be nervous about compromises with the free churches that might flutter Vatican dovecots. Other pressing issues may make a slog of ecumenical negotiations seem like a waste of time and energy or a distraction from the main thing. On the other hand, developments in wider culture and in theology may bring denominations together, creating shared assumptions, common ground, common challenges. And finally, the importance of local issues particular memories and contested histories should not be overlooked. Decision making at national level can be derailed or rendered ineffective when local narratives of cooperation or competition, fellowship or persecution hold sway. And for that reason at least, the story of Anglican Methodist unity needs to pay attention not only to the long view but also to the broad view. Thank you for your patience.
continue with Charlie and Bill to which you said a little back. Mm. Um, uh, I'm not sure this is a question, it's just a comment, really, but I'll try and phrase this question. Uh, the, the Anglican opposition, mm. as you said, came from two quarters mm. um, and, the, and actually represented uh, two theological views that cancel each other out. Mm. Um, my understanding is that the Methodist opposition was, was more kind of them um, singing from the same membership theologically, um, uh, well, more like the Anglican opposition, which is rather less. Is, is that the case? Yes, I think that's true. So there weren't any Methodist dissensions who thought the scheme wasn't Catholic enough. <laughs> um, so I think there was, there was a, ra- a bit of a range within the Methodist di- dissension, but the range was all on the evangelical or Protestant side. Um, and it ranged from Kingsley Barrett, um, who was um, you know, a New Testament scholar, Durham professor, um, very erudite, also very passionate um, preacher and evangelist uh, who wanted to make a reasoned case, principled case for the opposition through to the Voice of Methodism Association um, who I don't think anyone would call them reasoned. I mean they were rabid really and, and relations between the National Liaison Committee and, which was Barrett's group and the, the VMA were not always good because the VMA were, had a much more of a persecuted mindset I think. Yeah, but they all agreed, then they all agreed that episcopacy was not, was certainly not the Bene, not the essay of the church, arguably not the Bene essay either, and didn't want it. Yeah, well, curiously, of course, the Methodist Church in Ireland has has signed up to a to a, a scheme with the Church of Ireland, um, in which now the president of the Irish Methodist Conference is um, sort of instituted with with appropriate laying on of hands by by Church of Ireland bishops. I'm not quite sure how they man- how they've managed that actually. Um, that, that something obviously has gone on there, and I think there's a bit of disquiet about that. Um, yes, but certainly the position of um, Methodism and position of Anglicanism in the, the various parts of the UK is very different. Um, there was a big scheme in Scotland a few years ago, Scottish churches, SCIFU was the acronym, um, to bring the different churches in Scotland together, but the, the Kirk put a block on it. Um, yeah, but yes, how it plays out. And I don't know whether anyone's actually worked on whether, uh, where opposition either support or opposition within Met- British Methodism came from, and whether there is a skewing towards certain areas of the country or to certain, uh, certain regions. There probably possibly is. Thanks, Martin. How would you compare the range of opinion on the, the current proposals that are being looked at in the summer amongst, within Methodism compared to in the 1960s. I talking to, I mean, about, I think, I think it's really, really hard. To, it depends where you are. I mean, I've been on the Methodist Faith and Order Committee for ages, just about to be kicked out as time expired. And, and there is, I think, a, an assumption there that the scheme is basically okay. Um, but voicing it in a Methodist preacher's meeting and saying, oh, yes, it's this proposal that we could reconcile ministries by making the present conference a bishop. People are absolutely outraged. Where's this come from? You know, uh, so so I suspect there is a considerable amount of folk who would not know, who won't know about the scheme until it's put in front of them, and I suspect there will be a fair amount of resistance at grassroots level. Um, what the attitude? I'm, I'm, I kind of expect the conference to vote for it because they always do. <laughs> But that could just be me being a bit cynical. I, um, but what the general opinion... And it hasn't been very much, very much reported. Partly, I think, because it was waiting for the House of Bishops to give their judgment on their scheme and then for the Synod. So there hasn't been very much time. Um, 
Yeah. So it's a we wait to see. And whether there will be, whether there will be a lot of energy, whether there will be energy to advocate, energy to oppose, or whether there will just be a bit of a sense of well, there are more important things for us to be doing, and we do we really care? It's very difficult to tell. But I think there are some sort of some neuralgic yeah. buttons that could be pressed. Charles has said, you know, Methodists tend to have a very unfair view of bishops, um, or a stereotype, caricatured view. Well, it's yes, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Let's see. Well, I was just saying, on, from what I've heard from various people, um, I, I don't detect in necessarily a, a, an organised sort of groundswell. Um, I suppose if you read the comments on the bottom of the internet, I suppose that's, that's in terms of going, whose voices do we hear? Yeah. Um, but the nature of the, estab- the church movement is the established church and it you know, kind of I don't think those have, they haven't been much talked about, have they? And Methodists have, have had, historically had, um, different views about establishment, whether it was I mean, in Wesley's time and Watson. Watson was in favour of establishment in the early 19th century, um, certainly against disestablishment. And in more recent times, some Methodist spokespeople have said it, it's helpful. It's helpful for there to be a Christian voice embedded within or intertwined with the structures of, of power and authority. And, and other people have not, of course, agreed with that at all. Um, so I don't know that it's as it's as I don't think it's as deal breaking an issue as it would have been say a hundred years ago. And I think Methodists were lining up much more behind the strong push for free church, strong push for disestablishment. I think the point was made, I think Alison made it in the conversation with Charles, there are questions of style, style of worship and spirituality that many Methodists will feel we like Anglicans, we've got lots of friends of Anglicans, we don't want to worship like them, thank you. Um, we don't, f- or we feel it's a, different ex- it's a different expression of Christianity, which is fine for those who like that, but please don't make us do it too. I find that quite convincing, certainly. <laughs> mentioned the end of the talk last about um, the necessity of looking at local mm. and hearing local mm. situations and voices. Mm. One of the features I, I hear about now is how there are different dioceses treating very differently, and obviously different circuits treating very differently. Yeah. Is that a feature of the historical journey? Sort of differences across the country of local relationship and uh, mm. It's a really good question, George. I'm just I've got enough evidence to go on, really. Um, in the 19th century, there were a number of bishops who were keen to put out an olive branch to Methodists. Um, Christopher Wordsworth Lincoln was an example, but he was a bit... I mean, he was poking you in the eye with the olive branch, really, rather than... Rather than it, <laughs> he wrote a pastoral letter to the Methodists saying, yeah, please be reconciled to the church, and they said, no, thank you. <laughs> so it was a bit, it's just a bit clumsy. Um, I probably, he probably never met a Methodist, which, you know, might have been Methodist footman or something, but hadn't ever encountered one in real life. <laughs> um, there, there have been examples of persecuting bishops, certainly bishops who, who came down hard on Methodists in the eight, late 18th, early 19th century, and others who were much more relaxed. There are good examples, I think, of at a slightly lower level of, of good relationships. And lots of, I remember the number of Methodist presidents at conference whose it was sons went into the Anglican ministry and then some got up to quite high levels is, is it, is it would be an interesting investigation. So there were contacts. Um, but there probably wasn't a sort of diocesan policy in the way that there can be now. Yeah, more structured. It's a quick one about the influence of the two world wars. I mean, obviously it's a big subject Yeah, I think it's probably both 
um, a sense of a common enemy or a common task, but also a wish to meet that task in our own denominational silo. So the Methodists had a Christian commando campaign in the 40s, which was building on the image of military, so then sort of sending out evangelistic teams to factories and towns and so on. And that wasn't ecumenical, it was very much a Methodist activity. Um, and of course, chaplaincy issues um, earlier in the century and in the 19th century could be quite toxic, where you have Methodists like W.H. Rule standing up for the right Methodist ministers to minister to Methodist soldiers, Methodist prisoners in, in the jails, and um, pugnaciously asserting this against what they saw as the um, attitude of Anglican chaplains or Anglican sympathising commanding officers who, who didn't want Methodist ministers on the, on the camp. So they could be, they, it could, well, they could work together, or they could be examples of just institutional friction, I think, there. 